Hebrews chapter 5, from verse 12. Actually, you take it from verse 11, all the way to verse 14. Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 11 says, Of whom we have many things to see, and hard to be uttered, seeing yet dull of hearing. The author here in Hebrews was speaking previously about Jesus, who was a priest, or, or who is a priest, after the order, or the rank, or the status of Melchizedek. And he was going to explain some more of that to the people he was writing to. But he made a statement. He says there are many things that he wanted to see about Jesus being a high priest. But he said it was hard for him to speak because the persons he was writing to were dull of hearing. And that doesn't mean dull of hearing through their physical ears. It means they were dull of understanding. So he goes on in verse 12 and he says, For when for the time he ought to be he Teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become as such, and I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to, to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern uh, both good and evil. And then he goes on in chapter six to talk about, you know, moving past the elementary things and going on to the more um, advanced or the more mature things as a believer uh, in Christ. So, but the point he was making here is that these people he was writing to, he was saying that at the time he wrote to them in verse 12, he says that by that time they were supposed to have been teachers already because of the, the teaching they themselves has received and the length of time they were believers. But he says that they were not. So the expectation of the author here was that these people would, would have grown, that they would have matured. And it is not just his expectation, but it is an ex expectation that God has of every person who names themselves a Christian who says that they are born again. God expects growth and he expects development in a believer's life. It is not God's intention and it is not his desire that somebody be born again and then remain at that stage, which means that there are stages, there are uh, uh, levels of development for a believer. And being born again is just the base. And God requires, or he expects growth. There's one other passage I want to just highlight, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'll take it from verse 13. It's verse 13 all the way to verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And this is what it says. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacher comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So he was dealing, the, the, the author here is Paul. He was talking about spiritual things. Uh, but then he goes on and he makes a statement in verse 14. He says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. In verse 15, he says, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So Paul, he, he makes a distinction between what he calls the natural man and what he calls a spiritual man. A natural man is simply the person who is not born again. He is still controlled by the flesh. He is still, um, he's still a sinner. But a spiritual man is a person who has matured in his or her relationship with God. And this is what Paul was, was trying to get to. He was trying to get to, um, he was trying to help these believers in Corinth to get to the stage where they were spiritual. And we in the Bible study for the last few Wednesdays were speaking about things related to this, being matured, or Paul uses the term spiritual, similar terms, they mean the same thing, as opposed to being immature. And we would see the Bible has different terms for these different um, stages of our development. So in the Bible study, we had mentioned 
I wouldn't read it again, but we had mentioned 1 John chapter 2 and also numerous passages in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. For the last few Sundays, Pastor Richard has been going through the book of Ephesians and we have been kind of um, simultaneous, simultaneously doing that on Wednesdays as well. The stages of growth in a believer's life, according to the Bible, it, it, it gives us some phrase or some terms. It calls the first stage children, the second young men, and the third stage fathers. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 14, we could read that there. Children are those who are now born again. Those who have recently um, experienced what it means to be converted from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We call it being born again. Um, so it's coming into a relationship with God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul again uses a different term for that, and he calls it being seated. 1 John chapter 2 talks about a second stage of growth, and John in that passage calls it young men. So a believer should be moving from the stage of a child or childhood into the stage of youth or young men. And of course, these are general terms. Young men doesn't mean male alone. It means both male and female. So John calls that young men. And when we go to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul uses the term walk or walking to describe what young men do. Children are those who are start off seated. Young men are those who are walking. And in 1 John chapter 2, John describes the last stage of maturity, or he uses a term to talk about that last stage of maturity, and he calls it fathers, those who are mature, which is what another term we could use is spiritual. All right, so fathers, which is the term that John uses, is similar to what we could call a spiritual believer or a mature believer. And what that person does, in Ephesians, Paul tells us that person learns how to stand, how to hold his or her ground. And we will talk about that uh, in some detail this morning. And just to catch everybody up to speed, in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about we, are, we were raised with Christ. Just, when he, just as when he died, we died to God. We died in sin. But when he rose again, when he was resurrected from the dead, we, because of our faith in him, we also rose again. And then when we were, ro when we were raised with him, the Bible didn't say we start off just going and functioning one time. The Bible says he raised us up with him. But then he puts us to sit. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. And the reason why the Bible talks about seating is because to sit in the Bible speaks of a position of perfection, completeness, or rest. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible tells us that we move from that position of seating or sitting into a position of walking, movement, action. And the term walk means to live out. It means to uh, all the perfections and everything that has been completed on the inside of us, which is what happens when we were born again. We are now expected by God to move into the stage where we live out that perfections from the inside. So we had used this analogy. When a man who is a beggar, um, receives millions or billions of dollars. Somebody opens a bank account for him and put billions of dollars in that account for him in his name. That beggar instantaneously becomes a multi-billionaire. And that is like the child who's now born again. He is instantly, he or she is instantly a perfected, holy child of God. All the perfections that they would ever need is already in them in their spirit man. But just like the beggar, the beggar needs to learn. He's, he's now a multi-billionaire because he has the account, the bank account in his name, with the billions. 
but he has to learn how to withdraw the billions, how to spend it, and how to use what he buys to better his life, how to put it into work, put it into practice in his life. And that is what the stage of walking is about for us as believers. In this stage, we, we, we need to move to the stage in our lives where we learn be, because we know what we have, we now need to learn how to use it. Because there are many believers who are complaining today as Christians and not growing, complaining about God, complaining about other believers, complaining about life. And that is really a poor state of a believer. We should never be complaining about anything because when the Bible talks about walking in Ephesians 4, verse 1, what it means is to learn how to use what we already have and live out from that. So let me put it this way. This is one of the statements we had made, I uh, believe, on one of the Wednesday nights. Today, you are healed already for some sickness that you might might come up in your body in 2025. You already have the healing for that today. Today, you already have the finances for some problem that you would meet in 2030. If that problem and what you need to do lines up with God's will, and you need to overcome that problem to do what God's will is, God has already, even today in 2022, already provided the finances or the solutions to overcome that problem. God doesn't wait when the problem arises to provide the solution. God already did. It's like the man who was a beggar. He already has billions in his account right now. And if two or three years from now he encounters some problem, he don't need the billions. He don't. Let me rephrase that. If he encounters a problem in two or three years from now, he already has the money from today, right now, to deal with that. Even though the problem is not here as yet, he already has the money to deal with it. So he could face life with confidence. What he needs to do, however, is to learn how to use the money, how to withdraw it, how to use it. And that's what walking is. It means learning how to take what we have and use it. Instead of complaining and instead of um, you know, murmuring. And instead, sometimes we go before God and we say, God, you know, why are you not doing this for me? And I'm seeing other people getting this in their lives. And, you know, really and truly, it's not that God ain't doing it. God already did it. We need to learn how to use what he has done for us. And then the last thing, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul goes on to talk about after we do everything, that we could possibly do for any given situation. We need to learn how to stand. And the word stand means to enforce. It means to hold your ground. So everything that Jesus did for us on the cross, the finished work, the finished work means he provided everything. It means he did everything in us to perfect us. A person who is mature or who is a father who has grown and advanced and matured, that person learns how to enforce, how to stand, how to hold their ground. In other words, they learn how to enforce everything that Jesus has given to them and stand confidently. Rather than become frustrated, starting to doubt, starting to complain again, regardless of what the problem is, they stand firm and they remain resolute to use that too. When we were speaking about this, we had used the example of Job. When Job, at the beginning of the book, in Job chapter 1, the Bible tells us very clearly that Job was holy. It says that he, you know, there was no sin in him. He was a, a, a perfect man. He was holy. Even God was boasting about Job. But after Job went through all of the problems and the difficulties that he had, and friends came and they were telling him that he sinned and so on. When God finally appeared to Job and God started to speak to Job, and Job responded, Job responded by making a statement in Job chapter 42. 
And he says, I, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. What Job was saying there was, all the time I was only talking things that I heard. I was only saying things about you, which I heard other people said about you. But now, after I went through these situations, I know you. I have an experience with you and I could now talk from my experience. I don't need to depend on anybody else. And if you notice, one of the first things Job said when he was talking, he says, I have been speaking foolish words without knowledge. In other words, Job said I was complaining, so I'm going to shut up, as we say in Trini. I'm going to stay quiet. Job stopped complaining immediately. He stopped murmuring. He stopped saying anything. And what Job did is that Job stood in who this God is, who he knows this God to be, because he went through experiences with God. And he stood based upon that knowledge. And he stood based upon the strength he was able to get from God as a result of going through situations with God. And we're going to spend a little more time um, emphasizing that this morning. So we had said, this is a very, very quick and very brief review. When the Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are seated with Christ, or John and first John would use the term children, people who are now born again and still immature. How am I able to effectively learn how to remain seated? And how am I able to move from that stage of being an immature child and start growing and start developing? In Ephesians, the Bible tells us how. How do I start the growth process? The way I start the growth process is through prayer. The growth process, the minute I am born again, and I'm now a child of God, I begin my growth process by prayer. And the Bible tells us what to pray for. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 19, and it tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19, it tells us what to pray for. What should we pray for? Ephesians chapter 1 says we should pray for enlightenment. In other words, we could use the term revelation. What we should pray for is empowerment, or in other words, strength on the inside to be able to function. And this is the prayer a person who is a child who is still, you know, immature. And there's nothing wrong with somebody who is now born again, being immature. They are now born again. You know, they, they're now alive in Christ. And there's nothing wrong with that. What they need now is to grow. And the, the, the church needs to spend time praying for these young converts. And sometimes there are people who are born again for years and still haven't grown, haven't developed into a matured state. In order to move and in order to grow, we need to pray for enlightenment. What enlightenment or revelation should we pray for? Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 1 tells us. It says we should pray for the revelation or the knowledge or the enlightenment of what our hope is. In other words, we are asking God, God, show me what is the hope I have because you called me into relationship with you. And the term hope there doesn't mean something that may or may not happen. When the Bible talks about the hope we have in God, it is talking about a confident expectation of what he has provided for us. And the prayer we should pray is, God, show me what you provide for me, what it is in, you have in store for me, so that I can look forward to it. And the reason why the Bible begins with praying about the hope is because we as believers should not make the, um, the goal of our life to be successful here on the earth. This, is not, this should not be our focus, our primary focus. Our primary focus is always looking to what is after here, what is outside of this kingdom, this, this kingdom of, of darkness, what is after the earth, because we are not the children of this kingdom. We are the children of the kingdom of light. 
The second thing we need to pray about is to ask God what to reveal to us what our identity is. Who am I? And the church, we, and we as a church need to pray for young converts that they would begin to have a revelation in who they are. When Paul was praying this prayer in Ephesians 1, this is how we put it. He prayed that the church in Ephesus would know what is the, the glorious inheritance that God has in the saints. In other words, Paul was saying the God's inheritance is the saints, you and I. God considers you and me as believers to be his glorious inheritance. That means God looks at us exceedingly valuable. Beyond everything else God created, he looks at us as extremely valuable. And we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. We need to see us with the identity that God has given to us. And that is the second prayer. The third prayer is that we would know the power, the intensity, the magnitude, the greatness, excuse, of the power that God has given to us. Because if we know, we have a revelation of the power God has given to us, we wouldn't be complaining. When things go wrong in our life, we wouldn't be complaining because we would have the understanding that we have some power that can bring about change in situations. And if it is the situations are not changing, then that, that now, if we move on into the other stages of growth, we would learn how to enforce things that we have to bring about the changes we need. All right? But we'll talk about that a little more in our web. So the prayer is one of the prayers for enlightenment, the other prayers for empowerment. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prayed that the church would be strengthened with the might of God in their inner man, that is their spirit man, that is their soul man on the inside of them. So the prayer that we should be praying for ourselves if we are children in the faith, or the prayer that we should be praying for young converts in the church or young converts that we know. One of the prayers, God strengthen them with your power in their inner man. And inner man primarily means their spirit, but it also means their soul. And soul means mind, will, and emotions. In other words, God strengthen their wills so that they would always be able to choose to obey you and they would never compromise. Strengthen their emotions with healing so that they could function out of strong emotions and not wounded emotions. Touch them in their minds so they could function out of minds that are healed and not painful memories, not scarred memories, and not with the wrong worldview the wrong perception of life, but with the correct thinking, the correct mentality. The second thing is pray for relationship, that they would have relationship with Christ and that they would have relationship with the other believers. That's what we should pray for, for converts, and that what they should pray for themselves. And the third thing in terms of empowerment is that they be filled with the fullness of God. In other words, every characteristic of God, his, 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 his goodness, his holiness, his mercies, that they be filled with the fullness of God. So how am I able to grow after I'm born again? Is by praying that that, that person should be focused and, 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 and prioritize and pray in their lives. And all these things, prayer, obviously is based on the word of God. So for prayer to be effective, it means that that person must be constantly in the word of God and praying based on that word. So that is how to be able to sit. How are we able to walk? In other words, how are we able to learn how to use all the things God has given to us? We just looked at the things he gave to us, the hope, the power, the identity, the strength on the inside. We just looked at that. But how do I use what God has given to me? How do I learn to use these things? Ephesians tells us that. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that. In chapter 4, verse 22 to 24, it tells us some action 
actions, plural, that we need to perform. One of those actions it says in verse 22 is that we need to put off the old man. And when the Bible speaks about putting off the old man, if, 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 if you remember in, in Romans chapter 6, and to some extent in Romans chapter 7, Paul talked about that the old man was crucified with Christ. The old man really speaks about the old sinful nature which we inherited from Adam. It is a nature which only wants to sin, which only wants to disobey God. And we inherited that from Adam because of birth, just simply because we were born as a human being. And the Bible tells us that we need to put off that old man. To put off the old man means that we need to choose every day that we are not going to do what this old sinful nature prompts us to do. Because the fact is, when we were born again, God didn't remove that sinful nature from us. We still have that sinful nature because we are still human beings. And as a human being, what we inherited from Adam is still on the inside of us. The difference with us as believers is God has already, because of the death of Jesus on the cross, he has stripped that old nature of its ability to control us. So the old nature could still act up. We could still have desires to lie, to be unfaithful in marriage. And I'm just using that as an example. I'm not saying anybody here is doing that. Right? These are just examples. We may still have the temptation to be unfaithful in marriage. We may still have the temptation to be sexually loose. But the thing is, the fact that we have the temptation that comes from the old man doesn't mean we have to do it. Because when we were born again, as a, because Jesus died on the cross, instantly when we were born again, God stripped that old man of its power to control us. So the temptation may still be there, but we are not controlled by that. We don't have to do what the temptation tells us to do. And to put off the old man means choosing every day not to do what the old man wants us to do. And also not putting ourselves in the position to be tempted. So if I know that I am tempted with, with drinking alcohol too much and becoming drunk, then I shouldn't go in a bar and lie because that's a weakness for me. Another Christian might be able to go in the bar and buy a malt and sit down and talk to people, but I know I can't go there because if I go in the bar and I buy a malt, two drinks away, and I buy a whole bottle of vodka and I drunk. If I know my weakness is sexual uh, impurity, then I shouldn't be online late in the night doing research, quote unquote, because the easy temptation is to go into pornography. I should set up filters and all kinds of blocks on my computer or phone or whatever the, the device is to keep me from that. In other words, the point is to put off the old man means to choose every day. I'm not going to do what my sinful desires want me to do. But secondly, I am not going to put myself in the position to be tempted. The Bible says in, in 1 Thessalonians to abstain from the very appearance of evil. In other words, don't put yourself in that position. Yes, um, Abby, amen. All right? We don't put ourselves in that position. So that's what it means by put off the old man. But then the next thing, after we put off, after we make that decision in the morning, every day, I'm not going to do what my simple desires want me to do. And I'm not going to put myself in the position the next thing I need to do now is to renew my mind. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 says that. That's the next step. How do I renew my mind? I need to take whatever the word of God says about a situation or a circumstance. Well, let me say in this case is the temptation. So if I have a temptation to be um, unfaithful in marriage, it's probably a weakness or a temptation I have. I need to go to the, what the word of God says. And take what it says, study what it says, memorize, meditate on what it says, and then replace my thinking 
when it comes to unfaithfulness in marriage or, or, or being drunk or, or, or arguing and quarreling and all these things, replace what I think with what the Bible says. So sometimes when it comes to arguing and you know quarreling and so on, sometimes even we as believers have this thinking, I have a right to get vexed because she make me vexed. It's she who get me vexed. Or is he who get me vexed? Only time I was good. But the minute them come to the house, I get vexed one time. It's not me, it's them. And so we have this thinking sometimes that there's, there's, there's other people who cause us to act the way we are. And that's not true. The Bible shows us that we have the fruit. The Holy Spirit gives us the fruit called self-control. In other words, we have the ability as believers to control our mouth and to control our actions, no matter what other people do. Some, some people, even believers, say, you know, they, they know what does trigger me. They know how to strip sometimes when they do that and they still go on and do the same thing. So it's them who cause me to trip and it's them who cause me to, 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 to loose my mouth and tell them all kind of thing. Renewing our minds mean replacing that thinking with the correct thinking from the scripture. The scripture says be angry and sin that. This same chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, later on, says that. In other words, to renew our minds mean to remove, or I shouldn't say to remove, is to replace the thinking we have that is not biblical with the correct biblical thinking. And that means we have to be in the wood. It means we have to be deep in the wood. That is why John, in 1 John chapter 2, he says, the young men have the word of God abiding in them. Because it, the word of God has to be abiding in us so we could renew our minds. And then the last thing he says is to put on. To put on means, put on the, the new man. That's what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. To put on the new man means every morning I choose to do what the new nature in me wants to do. The new nature is the godly nature we have or we receive the minute we are born again. So when we were born as a human being, a normal boot, as a baby, we received the old nature from Adam. But when we were born again, we believe in Christ and his death and resurrection. What we receive instantly there because of that boot is the nature of God which is also called the new man. And today as believers, we have these two natures in us. We have the old man or the sinful nature, and we have the new man or the godly nature. And we have to decide, I'm going to put on this new man today. I'm going to do what this new godly nature wants to do today. And then put myself in the, in the environment as much as I could to facilitate that. Sometimes I may not be able to put myself in the environment. If I'm working and the people in the work only cussing or the, you know, the environment is not nice, I can leave the work and say I go home because that's my income source. But I could do as much as I could to be able to put on this new man, to facilitate what this new man wants to do. So this is the first thing here. How am I able to grow and to develop you know, how am I able to use what God has given to me and put it to work in my life? One of the first thing is actions. Put off the old man, make a decision to stop doing whatever the sins are that, that, that we are doing. Renew our minds in that area of sin or that area of weakness. Take the scriptures with respect to that weakness and meditate, memorize, soak it in our minds to replace the old ungodly thinking. And then the next step is to choose every day to do what the godly nature wants us to do. So I, I just want to use an example again, putting all these three together before we move on. If I know that my weakness or somebody else knows that their weakness is sexual impurity, unfaithfulness in marriage, or any form of, of, of um, loose sexual, loose living, 
What a person needs to do as a believer is every day choose, I'm not going to do that today. And I'm not even going to put myself in a situation to be tempted. And then that person, or if it's me, whoever the person is, need to take that, the Bible, and go through the scriptures where it talks about being pure, um, sexually, being holy, and keeping ourselves, and about the power of God that is able to keep us from sexual impurity. I need to spend time every day meditating in those verses, in those passages. And as long as it takes me, if it takes me a year to overcome this temptation, this particular weakness, lying, arguing, quarreling, whatever the sin is that I find myself falling into, I keep meditating in those scriptures until I overcome that sin. If my weakness is arguing and, and being quarrelsome and not maintaining peace where I am, I cannot stop studying those passages in the Bible and go on to study about prosperity financially because I still have weakness in this area. So as long as it takes me, I need to spend time getting into the word of God in whatever area of weakness I have. And what I see the word of God says I should do, put on the new man, choose to do that. And put myself in the environment as much as I could to be able to practice that. So this is what the first thing, how am I able to walk is the action. And then the second thing the Bible tells us in chapter five is we don't do these things by ourselves. It is not by might. It is not by power, but it is by the spirit of God. So chapter five tells us that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, all these actions here that we spoke about, we need to be doing these things depending on the Holy Spirit to en enable us, to empower us, to help us to do these things consistently. And one of the things I just want to put a plug in here when we speak about these things, sometimes we don't get it right. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes instead of holding our mouths, we let people have a piece of our minds. And sometimes we don't always, we are not always consistent in this life as a believer. And there's no condemnation to us if we fail. God doesn't condemn us and we shouldn't be condemning each other. We shouldn't even be condemning ourselves. We simply confess it to God, admit and acknowledge before God our fail. We go to him. The Bible says if we confess, he will forgive. We look for his cleansing. And we keep moving. We keep walking. But the, the way we, were, we are able to keep walking, Ephesians 5.18 tells us, is by depending on the strength which the Holy Spirit gives us. So Ephesians 5.18 says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It says don't be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. To be filled means to be empowered and to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit is similar to the phrase when people talk about baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what those terms simply mean is the Holy Spirit empowers us on an ongoing basis, continuous basis. This is not being filled once. But this is continuously, there are repeated times. If you read the book of Acts, there are numerous times believers, the same believers experience being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't only give us empowerment once. He doesn't only come and, 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 and release his power in us once. Throughout our lives as believers, as we go through situations, we have fresh empowerment, fresh anointing to face the, the new situations and circumstances. And you know, this is amazing. We as believers have access to fresh anointing and fresh empowerment to face each new challenge and situation. And sometimes, many times, we as believers, we don't access it. Many times we live in our weaknesses, we live in our struggle, and there's so much power we can access. And we access it 
by the Holy Spirit. Zechariah tells us that not by might, not by power, but by. So how am I able to, to, to be filled with the Spirit is pray again. Remember Jesus in Acts chapter 1 told the disciples to wait for the promise of the Father. In other words, go and pray. That's what he told them to do. And stay in prayer until you are filled. How do you know you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Is when you begin to experience the changes. When you begin to experience sins in your life, you overcome them. When you begin to experience character being developed in your life. When you begin to experience things that you were struggling with. Attitude problems, sin problems, whatever things you were struggling with. Now you find that you are kind of overcoming them a little more. This is evidence that the Holy Spirit is empowering you. He fills you because he is producing changes in you. I put it differently. Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we know the fruit, nine fruit, nine aspects. Love, joy, peace, patience, and all these things. When I begin to see these qualities, this character, being developed in my life, then I know that I am experiencing the empowerment or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. People talk about speaking in tongues, and, and yes, that's part of it. But the core evidence of being filled with the Spirit is a character change. It's not so much speaking in tongues. That's just, that's on the surface. But the depth of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives when he fills us, is change. He changes us. And again, Galatians chapter 5 tells us the changes. One of the changes there is, is, is patience. But the King James is the term long-suffering. When you see, when you realize in yourself that you are going through problems in life, and you're praying, and you're not seeing the changes, you're not seeing God answering and intervening, the way you want, and time going by. But yet you're seeing that you are being persistent. You realize that you're not giving up, but you're persevering. That is showing you that the Holy Spirit is developing patience in you. And that is showing you that you are filled with the Spirit because you are developing the character that only the Holy Spirit could develop in you. So the prayer is God Fill me with your spirit. Empower me. And that is true prayer. We need to, to, to go before God and pray and stay before God and pray until we have this, we experience this infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean we do nothing else but pray. What, what, what I mean by stay in prayer is every day, we carve time out, we put time out to pray. And to seek God for this infilling, for this empowerment that he gives. And we don't stop praying for that until we experience it. And only you would know when you are filled, because only you would know how your character is today and how your character is changing over time. People might see it over time, but you alone would know the changes you are going through. And this, this process of being filled with the Holy Spirit is what we call sanctification. It is where the Holy Spirit more and more changes us. So the word sanctify means to set apart from something that is normal and average to something that is set apart for God's use. It's so the Spirit changes us. So we become more and more like God in our life. And this process of change is a process where the Spirit helps us to use, he, he begins to teach us how to use what God has given to me so that I could put it to work in my daily life. So I'm not seeing finances, my, my family's struggling, struggling financially. But the Bible says I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. How do I access those heavenly blessings to become a reality in my earthly suffering right now? When I am filled with the Spirit, the more I, 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 I develop my relationship with the Spirit, is the more He teaches me that personally. This is a personal relationship. This is not like somebody could, could come on a Sunday morning and preach and tell 
other people how to develop their relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's a personal thing. So I'll give you an example. Two believers living in their separate families, separate houses, might get up in the morning to pray. And the Holy Spirit will tell one of them, just read one verse and don't say anything in prayer. Just remain quiet. And that is it. The, the other person, the Holy Spirit might tell them, I want you to study this chapter today. And when you finish studying it, I want you to go into some, some deep prayer about the issues in this chapter for you and for your family. Two different ways the Holy Spirit deals with two different believers. But the common thing is both of them are growing. And the reason is because the growth, they are not competing with each other to grow. They are learning the Holy Spirit for themselves. And so their growth process and their growth path and their experiences will be different because they have individual relationships with the Father or with the Holy Spirit as they learn to follow the Spirit every day. And that falling is the submission path when he directs. So this is how we walk. This is how we begin to mature. We, we take some actions, put them off, renew it and put them on. And then we ensure we do all of that with the empowerment that the Holy Spirit gives, with the infilling that he gives. And I just want to spend a little more time, a little more detail in this, um, this last part. Here in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul goes on to talk about the last stage of growth or maturity, which he calls learning how to stand. In 1 John chapter 2, John describes people who are fathers. Fathers are those who are mature. They are spiritual. They are full grown. And Paul uses the term stand to describe what fathers do. Fathers learn to stand. So let me just read um, 1 John chapter 2 so that we can all be on the same page. This is what John says, 1 John chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse, verse 13. He says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And John was very specific. He says, fathers know him who is from the beginning. And he repeated the exact phrase in the very next verse. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. How, how do we know somebody has matured and has grown, full grown, and is, is, is spiritually matured in the field? It is when that person knows him who is from the beginning. And this phrase, him who is from the beginning, is describing God in all of his magnificence and in all of his excellencies, his power. The Bible tells us in the beginning, Elohim created everything. He's in, in the beginning, Elohim said, let there be, let there be, let there be, and so on. The word Elohim is the plural of El. El is the word or the name given to God. And it describes God as creator. It describes God as all-powerful, all-knowing, um, the, 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 the all-sufficient God. El, all right? So when he talks about the fathers, know him who is from the beginning, he is saying fathers are those who have an experience with God. And they have experienced God not only as the God who forgives their sins, which is what children know God as, the one who forgives them. Fathers do not only know God as the one who overcome Satan and principalities and powers. Young men know that because they have overcome the wicked one. But fathers also know God in all of his might. 
they know God in all of his excellencies, his wisdom, his power, his patience, his kindness. In other words, they know God in a variety of his character qualities. And why? Because they have gone through situations in life. And they went through those situations in life with God. Just like Job. And they have now seen God with their own eyes. Just as what Job says. Job says, no, my eyes have seen you. In other words, these people, male and female, over their time, while they have been alive, they went through all kinds of situations. But they didn't just go through the situations. They learned who God is. They had experiences with God when they went through these situations. And now they have come through many situations. And they can look back and they could see new things they learned about God through the various situations. They could talk about their personal relationship with God and how they know him personally. They could talk about how they used to only sing about God is a great God. But now they experience his greatness on the inside. And these people will testify and say nothing could get them to doubt God now. Nothing could get them to backslide now because they went through too much things with God and they have experienced God in such a depth that in their minds, it makes no sense backsliding. Even if things in their life still challenging and even if things in their life still difficult, because of their experiences with God, they will stand, they will remain full, they will not give up. They will not um, doubt anything that God said. They wouldn't doubt whether he would work for their good or not. They would enforce, they would stand, they would hold their ground in their belief and in their relationship with God, which is what Ephesians says. After you have done all to stand, stand. What does it mean to do all? It means we learn God, we understand God, we experience God through situations in our lives. And as we go through those experiences with him, we also learn what he requires of us, and we do it. But, but the key thing is we learn God, we experience God for ourselves. So I want to, just, just want to say this. Sometimes there are people who go through hard situations in life. I mean, I don't want to, 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 to use situations as an example because every situation for each person is unique. And I don't want to say one situation is worse than the other. So I'm just going to say, we go through difficult things in life, every one of us. But there are some people who come through the situations but they don't really learn much about God. They don't really experience God. And so what happens is these people, these believers come through the situation and they will tell other people, you don't know the stress I went through. And you don't know the pains I went through. Like, I went through real things in life. And that's a fact. But the question is, what have you learned from those things? And how much more about God do you understand having gone through those things? How much more intimate is your relationship with God having gone through those things? In other words, it is one thing to say that I went through problems, but it is a totally different thing to say I have lived as a result of what I went through. And I didn't just learn principles. I didn't just learn things. I experienced God. And I have a depth of relationship with God today that I didn't have before. And this depth of my relationship with God, it causes me to be grounded. It causes me to stand firm. It causes me 
to be resolute in what I believe. And it causes me to be unshakable. In other words, when you talk about a person who has grown and matured, spiritually matured, who is a father in the faith, you are talking about a person whose character is developed. You are talking about a person who is secured in their identity. You are talking about a person who is secured in their faith. They are not wavering. But most of all, you're talking about a person who has a depth of relationship with God, which not much other people have. And it is the depth of relationship with God that causes them to be full, to stand. So let me just describe it this way before I, before I move on. A person who is a child in the faith, who is immature, is you recently born again, and, and is no start at all. That person, all that person knows about is I am forgiven and I have the best life because I'm a child of God. And their full experience is about the forgiveness and the love of God. They don't really know about God more than that. A person who is a young man in the faith, who has matured a little bit, grown a little bit, what they know about is, the Bible tells us here, they know about the strength that God gives. They know about the word of God. And they know about victory over the wicked one. They could talk about God's word. They could talk about the, 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 the power of God. Because they see the power of God at work in spiritual warfare against the demonic spirits. They could exercise the authority over the demonic spirits. And they could speak about God in that context. But the minute you move to the stage of a father, a, a full-grown person, a mature person, you are no longer talking about sins and forgiveness of sins. You're not even talking about victory over Satan because you're going past that. You're not talking about the power of God to heal the sick because you're going past that stage. No, you are talking about God himself. Now you are talking about fresh revelations of God that you have. Now you are talking about the depth of your experience with God. Jesus says it this way in John. Jesus says, this is eternal life. To know you and to know Jesus whom you have sent. In other words, the essence of maturity, the essence of being a mature believer is not how much demons we could cast out. It's not how much messages we could preach from the word. It's not how much verses we could quote. But how much we know God. The essence of maturity is what's the depth of my relationship with God? When I speak to people, do these people get from me my experiences with God? Do they get from me my understanding of God as Father? Are they able to glean from me the power of God because I could speak from my experience how he worked in my life? Are they able to get encouragement from me because they see a person who went through struggles and didn't only overcome it, but they matured, they grew, they have become more... Um, resolute, they have become more firm and, and grounded in their lives. Th that is what being a father in the faith speaks about. It talks about a person who is not focused anymore about demonic spirits and, and them things as elementary things for him. The word of God and meditating on the word as elementary for him. He is consumed with God himself and living out that character in front of people. And he is full. I go back to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. This is what, what, what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
in this chapter, when Paul speaks about in the verses after he talk about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the wrestling or the warfare he speaks about is really a warfare against wild. So what Paul is telling us, we should be able to stand, but stand specifically against wild. Let me just explain what these words mean. The word stand in the original Greek, it means to place something or to put it or to set it in, in a location. Like you take your phone and you put it on the table. You, you, you place it there. Or the word stand means to make something firm, to fix it, to establish it. In other words, the word stand means immovable, unshakable. And the word wiles comes from this Greek word, metavia. And what wiles means? Wiles means craft. Trickery or deceit. Wiles means deception or lies. So back here, when Paul says that we must put on the whole armor of God and we need to be strong in the Lord, the reason why we need to be strong in the Lord, the reason why we need the armor is so we could be able to stand. Being strong in the Lord and putting on the armor is what it means when we become mature and fathers in the feet. But why do we need to stand? We need to stand because there are wiles or deceptions that the enemy brings. And the whole armor that God gives us in chapter 6 and learning how to be strong in the Lord, we learn that through our experiences with God. We go through experiences with him. All of these things helps us to be able to stand firm when the enemy comes to try to deceive us and to trick us. And you know, sometimes we might say, if a person grows a little bit and they mature a little bit, and with all the preaching and teaching we have today, that person shouldn't be deceived. It should be easy. And all the amount of Bible we have today and whatnot. And the amazing thing is, if Eve lived in a sinless environment, and Adam, and both of them still sin. The Bible says the woman was deceived. Eve was deceived. But Adam was worse because he went along with it as the man is supposed to stop the whole thing. And they lived in a sinless environment. It shows us the power of deception. Deception is not a light thing. It is a very, very serious thing. And Satan functions. The Bible says he's the father of lies. He functions by deception. And so what this warfare in Ephesians 6 is speaking about, it is speaking about a battle to keep us from deception, to keep us firm and resolute or standing in our belief and not to falter, not to fail. And how we get there well, how we get there to the point where we are mentally resolute in our belief in God? How do we get there where emotionally we don't let the ups and downs in life cause us to become a little weak in our feet? How do we get there where even physically in our bodies, when things are not too good or financially, we are still secure, we are still strong, we are still standing, we are still resolute? is when we go through issues with God and we learn how to draw strength from him when we go through the situations and when we put on the armor that he has given to us. And, and, and I guess all of us know the armor. I wouldn't go into detail on that this morning. What I want to focus on is this first part, being strong in the Lord, is when we learn how to go through situations with God and learn how to draw strength from them. And this is what I want to focus on. How am I able to stand? How do I reach this stage as a mature person? How do I reach this stage as a full-grown um, father in the feet? I need to learn what the armor is and how to put it on. And don't just put it on, but keep it on. And the second thing is I need to learn, again, dependence how to draw empowerment 
through my relationship with God. How to learn to draw strength from God. And this is the thing that, that to me, is, is really, um, I mean, everything we said today is applicable to us. But this, I find, is, 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 is of immense importance. Do you know how to draw your strength from God? Because of your relationship with him, or while you are maintaining and building your relationship with him, do you know how to draw strength? I could use an analogy here. The plants that we see outside here, the trees and all the others, they have roots in the ground. And those roots have little vessels in them. They are called xylem vessels and fluent vessels. For those of us who did biology in school, and these roots, we could see the roots if we dig into the ground, but we cannot see the vessels because they are inside the roots. And what the vessels do is that they draw water and minerals, nutrients from the soil. And when these vessels, they go all up into the branches and to where the fruits and the leaves of the trees, trees are. And so these, these, these vessels take the water and the minerals from the roots cause them to travel all the way up to where the leaves are. Where they reach the leaves and the fruits, there's a little boundary where the leaves and the fruits draw or they suck the nutrients from the vessels into the leaves and into the fruits. So the leaves flourish more, the fruits grow more. That is what I mean by learning how to draw our strength from God. The, 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 the leaves and the fruits have a relationship with the source, which is the soil. And that relationship is the vessel that connects the two of them. And we have a relationship with God as well because of Jesus. But what connects us is our faith. What keeps us in this relationship is the faith. And we need to learn when we go through situations in life to not give up on God with faith. Sometimes God allows things in our lives which seems to be unfair for us. And I know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it, it, it seems as if what he is allowing, if he is a holy God, he should have never allowed us in the first place. I mean, God, you are holy God. How you could let this happen to me? You're supposed to be just. You're not supposed to let a wicked man have what I'm asking you for. And so sometimes when we go through things in life, there are times God allows things to happen, which to us seems to be very unfair, and God seems to be a very unjust and an unholy God. And the challenge for us in those times is not to be deceived into thinking that, but to maintain our faith. And not just to maintain our faith in God, but to dig into the roots and learn how to draw strength from God to keep on maintaining faith. And to dig in the fruit in the root means how we need to learn how to pray. Sometimes when, when things happen and it's not nice, it's not pleasant, it's not good, and it feels unfair to us, and worse yet, it goes on and on, and days, months, years pass, and I'm still remaining the same. When time goes on and, and it becomes drawn out, it becomes easier to give up. People on the outside not seeing my feet is only I who know whether I have feet or not. So people on the outside might see you and they might see, hey, this man is a strong believer, but they don't know you give up long time. Or some people might see you and say like, he, he looked like something wrong with he or she, but they don't know how long you hold on still. And you're still maintaining your faith because that's an internal thing. Only you and God knows. And so what do we mean by drawing strength from God? We mean as we go through situations, each of us personally need to learn how to go before God and place ourselves before God and say, God, this thing ain't easy. 
As a matter of fact, this thing to me looks like you on fear. And right now, all I want to do is just cuss out the place and leave. Forget you and backslide. Right? I just want to get out of this. Because this thing is making sense. When I watch other believers, it's like you blessing them and you ignoring me. Worse yet for the sinners. When I watch what's going on with them, it's like it's better I forget Bible and, and, and church and, and, and I just go and sin. But, but, but being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might means learning how to go before God and say, God, this is how I feel. And I'm being frank with you. I feel you real and fear to me. But in the midst of my pain and in the midst of my suffering and this thing going on long, God, give me the grace to endure more. Give me the strength to endure more. And most of all, give me your peace. Give me your joy. Give me encouragement by your spirit. And that is something nobody could teach in a Bible class. Nobody could preach and, and other people just pick up that. That's a, a, a lifetime process. We have to learn by experience. So to become a father in the faith, we don't become matured like that. And we don't grow like that by listening to preaching and studying the Bible. That state or that stage of maturity comes through living it. So where we are empowered in the faith. So in other words, we begin with relationship with the Father. That is, you know, uh, being born again, we experience relationship with him. We then go through experiences with the Father, whatever the experiences are, good, bad, but we go through experiences with him. We learn not only the principles from the, the, the experiences, but we learn about God himself. And that is how we begin to know God. And because of us knowing God, that is how we receive the strength, the empowerment that comes from him. And this process continuously takes place as long as we, it should take place as long as we are alive. Relationship with God, experiences with God, causing us to learn God more, causing us to experience more empowerment. And on and on, it keeps going. And this is the process of, of growth. Yes, Alicia, the experiences bring out our nature. And it doesn't only bring out our nature, but it helps us to develop that nature. The, it helps us to um, experience the fullness of what God's nature is on the inside of us. Um, you know, we could use this analogy. It's like when you, when you look at a, a flower, a rose, whatever kind of rose uh, we like, when it is now growing, it, when it has now started out in it, as a bud, we just see it as a bud. But then the true nature of that flower, or that bud is still on the inside. And as it is nurtured and as it grows and the bud begins to open, then we really see the full potential that was always on the inside of it. It, it was always there. When the bud opened up, it wasn't only then that all the colors and the scent and everything now came. It was there all the time, but it was now open. It's the same thing with us. The nature of God is already in the inside of us. The holiness and everything, the perfection, the completed work, everything is in the inside. But this process of growth is what helps us to open out, so to speak, and for that nature to come out and to really maximize and, 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 and really fully demonstrate all that we already have on the inside of us. And so this is the growth process. Relationship, we start off with. Experiences, we go through with God. The experiences with God helps us to know him personally. And that knowledge, that personal revelation of God is what empowers us. And then we go continuously go through this experience. Okay, so I hope that this was a, a really good help. This message is for me today. I see Elisha, Elisha posed this message for me today. And as an answer to a question I asked God this morning. So God really <laughs> he is on time. Amen, Elisha. Amen. Yes, he is on time. 
Th this is a process that, that we, um, as long as we are alive, we need to ensure we are continuously going through. Because if we stop, if we go through this process, and then let me tell you something, when you begin to grow and to develop, the level of opposition you get from demonic spirits would increase. You know, there's a saying, um, new level, new devil, simply means the more growth we have is the more deceptions. Remember, that's what Ephesians says, the wiles of the devil. It is the greater the intensity of the deceptions will come. And those deceptions will come in the form of oppositions. And if a level of intensity of opposition comes and we falter there, we will stop moving forward. But the good news is God has given us the power already. We already have the power today to handle temptations and oppositions that the devil will throw to us tomorrow. And years after that, God already put it in us. So we are already victorious. All we need to do is to learn how to use it. And that comes through this process of experience. So 